Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jamar. Today's episode 123 and we're interviewing Samantha. How are you doing, Samantha? I'm doing good. How are you, Jim? I'm doing well. Glad to be interviewing you. So let's yeah. dive in and get started. Tell me about your childhood. Okay. Um, my name is Samantha and I'm 31. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska for a little background information, but um, I've grown up in Omaha, Nebraska, and I am the oldest of three kids. Um, so I grew up um, a caregiver and taking care of um, everyone, and that kind of is important because it plays in the why were you taking care of everyone? Where were your parents? Um, so let me, uh, uh, my mother has a developmental disability um, and a traumatic brain injury from a head trauma. So she operates, it's like having like a 16 year old girl. My mom okay. is a best friend or is, is a mom. And uh, that, so it's like growing up with like a sister, you know, not having, Per se, your typical mother role, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, and uh, my dad has always drank, has always had an alcohol problem, um, prescription medication problem. So he was usually drunk. And when he wasn't passed out drunk, uh, uh, he would be hitting us, uh, throwing furniture. Uh, having a fair, just all kinds of stuff that you know um, is traumatic, to be honest. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, Looking back at that, it's pretty crazy, you know. Yeah, I um, I didn't realize how strong addiction can play in like genetics. Uh, it certainly follows down in uh, families. So um, I graduated high school in 2008. I was top of my class and was on the Bellevue West dance team and uh, got all A's and um, I really loved school. Um, I was bullied quite a bit growing up. Everyone had short hair. <laughs> so so I don't, real quick, I don't know. Going, going I back, that. going back just a minute, what kind of abuse yeah. was your, what was your dad doing? Was he just hitting you and stuff? No. And um, like the, now that I'm older, I, I've tried, I've, I've worked on forgiveness, um, physical abuse, emotional, sexual verbal, spiritual, um, sorry, I, uh, I remember, um, one of his, like, one of the times that he was really, really drunk, he threw a, uh, like, a, uh, what is that called, like, chairs that you put your feet up on, is that ottoman? Yeah, I think an ottoman, Maybe. yeah. Yeah, he threw an ottoman. I was 14 because um, his drinking got really bad when I started in high school. So um, that's when I started to experiment with substances. Like I would take, you know, like a, like I'd be like 12 years old and like take a wine cooler or a beer out of the fridge or whatever. Uh, uh, that's very young. What, what was the reason you were reaching for the wine cooler? Did you know that was going to get you drunk? I don't. I don't think I understood what being drunk really meant when I was younger. I just knew that I did not want to be yelled and screamed and cussed at and hit and. Um, we didn't have electricity half the time. We, um, it was really rough. I'm thankful that both of my maternal grandparents um, were there for us, kind of like a second mom and dad, uh, like really 
we would run, I would run to their, they live two miles away. So I'd run to their house whenever um, things got bad at home. And that was all the time. I don't think I knew that it was going to get me drunk. I think the wine coolers just tasted good. I mean, they still do, but mm. you know what I mean? Um, I just remember being very young and thinking my dad was really mean and being scared of him and not sure why he was acting the way he was. Like I have grown up with so much screaming and yelling. I can't stand confrontation. Now, I still don't like it. I still get get triggered. But I grew up with, um, he, he started with alcohol abuse and then moved on. But that's what I grew up seeing. So I guess I thought, no big deal if you have a wine cooler or whatever. How are you doing in school? How was did I doing you, in school? Yeah, you said you got good grades and everything? Yes. Um, so I actually got to start school when I was three because I passed all the tests early. Like um, now they make a cutoff age. Like I wouldn't be able to go to school that young now. But um, so I was 13 turning 14 when I went to high school. And that first year, I think the lowest grade I had was one D and one C the rest were A's and then um, sophomore year um, I decided school is the only thing I can control in my life so while like that's the only thing I felt I was good at was school even though um, I danced ballet my whole life um, and things like that so I was like in the high ability learners in the honor society um, like I said, graduated top 10% of my class, um, went to nursing school. So I did really good in school. Um, How was your social life during school? Because one of the things I've heard from people who their parents were addicts was they were afraid to have friends over and it affected their, you know, friendships. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I didn't really bring friends home first off because my dad, all he did was yell and scream. Like he doesn't know how to talk nice. Like, um, and I couldn't have friends over cause he'd always be lounging around in his underwear and it was so weird um, and uncomfortable. And I didn't want my friends, uh, seeing a dirty house or asking why my dad was stumbling all over the place or just knowing anything. It wasn't until high school um, that I brought a friend over, but her dad was a crack addict. So we shared something mutual that she understood. Uh, I still don't like bringing people around him and stuff like that um, yeah it affected um friendships growing up like people would call the house you know back in the 90s to see if i was home and yeah. you know they could hear in the background screaming and um i think yeah I think it affected me a lot. Yeah, well, friendships are important. Um, I don't really have friends now, to be honest. I feel like it's hard to find good people out there. Yes, that's definitely. Myself quite a bit. Yeah, no, that's definitely a thing is finding. I mean, that's one of the most important things, I think, in recovery is your community. Kind of it is good old-fashioned um, old saying you are who you surround yourself with i think that's really true if you hang out with idiots you're going to do dumb things if you hang out with people that are a little wiser you're less likely to get in any type of trouble ah uh, 
Absolutely. I can, part of my story has to do with hanging around the wrong people. And you know, that's so true. My grandpa used to say that. And I always thought it was silly until I got older and realized, yeah, uh, pretty much the company you keep. Kind of. I always tried to fit in. I never, I didn't have like a group of friends. I kind of just floated around. I didn't really, because I was friends with everyone. I was nice to everyone. Like, I don't like being mean or confrontation or um, drama or any of that. Um, drinking and alcohol and drugs led me to a lot of um, problems that I don't think I no, not think I know I wouldn't have gone through if I hadn't, but I made it out. <laughs> what kind of okay. things would you do? Uh, okay, for example, so I started smoking marijuana when I was 13. And I was hanging out with a bunch of 18 year old boys, and I thought the only way to get love was not to be promiscuous, but I guess I thought it was normal. Looking back, it wasn't like my uh, my dad didn't look out for me at all. He just, well, he just really didn't. He just really wasn't there. But um, just the, I think seeking the attention of older boys and older people was not good because that's who brought like substances around do you, um, think, do you think you were trying to replace your dad's love with love from other people oh my god absolutely i struggle with codependency and all kinds of things and i i, I know parents do the best they they can like i said i can't sit there and blame him for everything. Um, yeah, I always looked for attention from older people. Um, I remember I was 15 years old and I was a sophomore um, and I decided to go party that night, smoke some weed, drink, got into a car with a drunk driver. This was October 21st, 2005. Um, we got into a car accident and I broke 30 bones. Oh my um, God. Yeah, and that plays a role in addiction too. Um, but uh, I broke my neck and my spine and I was in the pediatric intensive care unit for two weeks. And um, I almost, like I really almost died um, and no one else got hurt. And um, I had like a whole dance career set up. Well, you break the back can't be on the high school dance team or and can't do ballet and so that that was the one thing I was passionate about besides school that I was good at so when that got taken away um you know it'd be like if you weren't able to podcast all of a sudden or you know what I mean yeah. like something you were really passionate about um and so I struggled with I and I still do struggle really bad with severe chronic pain um, but I looked to alcohol and we, at the time, that was all I was doing, um, to cover up that pain, cover up the pain at home. Um, I got in trouble for fist fighting when I was 17. I hate fighting. Um, and I threw the first punch. I don't know what happened. It was, so lots of partying sneaking out at night I still you still what? Um, I still got straight A's still okay. worked hard um I don't know how I managed to do that because I was getting high and drunk almost every day and going to school like that I'm just being so blatantly vulnerable and honest here um I don't know uh I guess those are like the mild, like in my youth, that's what hanging around in order. I was really young. Like I trust everyone and I did then. And 
you know, I thought, you know, no one's going to hurt me, you know, these boys are nice. No, no. <laughs> um, it led to sexual assaults and all that before I was 18. So I think um, I just a lot of drinking weed at that time. Drinking, so your some of the things I, drinking your favorite thing to do back then? In high school, it was. Um, uh, do you like remember marijuana. what you felt like? Do you remember what you felt like when the I first drank? time you ever did it? Well, the first time you ever oh, did sure. it, do you remember what well, you felt like? I was 13 and um, it was the first time I drank and smoked weed and um, I had some jello shots and that made me feel like euphoric, slightly dizzy. Um, and then when I smoked the weed, like I don't even remember very much to be honest with you, uh, except that I couldn't hold my head up and there was like, I was riding around in a car and the music was bumping and like, um, I just remember being at a party and thinking like, oh, so this is what it's all about. It made me super sleepy and just black out to be honest. <laughs> um, later the next day, uh, a bunch of football players got caught. Some of my name got leaked out my parents took me out of school and took me to the doctor's office and I was grounded for four months after it came back positive for marijuana like like truly um like no one in my family had done any drugs per se until I came along I mean alcohol is a drug but um it was bad I remember letting I remember feeling so let down but um, it made me happy. It lasted a really long time. I remember being happy when it wore off just because I didn't know anyone. Like it was so unsafe. I didn't know anyone at this party. And I was just like blindly putting my life and safety in people's hands. It's crazy. Yeah, looking back, it is, you know. We all do, we all, I think we all have things we look back upon. We're like, I can't believe I did that. Oh, yes, I have lots of them. Yeah. Um, learning experience. <sighs> Did you have any other learning experiences while you were young and drinking? Well, um, I, I don't know, like how much to say, like, I don't want to bore anyone. I don't want to, I don't also don't want to be too graphic. But uh, I no. remember I was like 14. And was at, like, I was partying every night over the summer with, like, my best girlfriend. Uh, her dad was a crack addict. And she had an older brother that was 19 at the time. So we were hanging around his older friends um, and drinking with them. So when I got raped at 14 and my virginity taken away that way, um, that set up like the cycle for domestic violence and narcissistic abuse, um, not loving myself, thinking I was only good for carnal pleasures or, you know, whatever. Um, I, uh, Guess that's my youth to sum it up in a nutshell and that was all before 18 that was only the first five years that's crazy it's been almost 20 years um so those are those are the biggest experiences um once i got into that car accident man that changed my life uh but so did all those events so those are the biggest um, I guess you could say events in my youth. Yeah, oh, was... When I got in trouble for fist fighting, I was on probation and they made us do diversion and we would still drink 
every night on it. Like we figured out a way to like stop drinking at midnight and then you'd sober up for the, you know, the breathalyzer. And so like we had a problem then we just, I guess it was quote unquote normal because everyone was drinking and smoking weed and staying out all night, you know? So it, at that time it didn't seem that big of a deal. So you said that was the first five years. What was life like once I'm you graduated? Sorry, my phone. Say again? I'm sorry, my phone broke out or broke up. Oh, no, that's okay. I was saying that was the first five years. What was it like when you graduated high school? Or also, real quick, just remind me, what what age were you when you got into the, the accident? I was 15. I'd only been 15 for a month. And you got that horrific accident. So were you prescribed painkillers and stuff? Yes, I was. And I never in a million years would have thought that I would be fighting for my life from 15 to now. Um, I've been sober of opioids and benzodiazepines for um, since February 2nd of 2021. Um, I didn't start out abusing them. I took them as prescribed and um, the weird thing with my spine is it's still broken. And I've had um, four failed spinal fusions. So I've had four other spine surgeries on top of it. Um, and they all failed. So back then they prescribed me Vicodin for pain. And I had this attitude at first that you can't live your life on pain pills. And then I got this pain doctor who was like, oh, no, no, yeah, you can. no um it I didn't realize like so I went all of high school taking opioids yep you broke up sorry I don't know where we went it, like oh, just shut out yeah so, so you were <laughs> sorry doing about that yeah, no problem. So I think you were talking about taking opioids. Yeah. Um, so at first they were just five milligram Vicodins I could have every six hours. Um, they helped with pain. Um, I was drinking and using marijuana on top of it. Um, I was not dependent on them yet in high school. I wasn't physically dependent on them or um, psychologically. Uh, looking back, it's really scary how, men, how much um, pain medicine they were giving me and like how willy nilly with the prescribing. Like I just, they'd hand me off from doctor to doctor and um, just no supervision. I didn't know how powerful these medications were. I didn't know, you know, you see people like in movies going through heroin withdrawal or, you know, whatever, but uh, God, that like, I'm really, really fortunate to, um, to be alive that I didn't uh, overdose back in high school when I was, you know, really naive about all that stuff, thinking nothing can hurt me. I just survived a huge car wreck. I don't think opiates are gonna hurt me, but they hurt me more than I know. Um, I graduated high school at 17 in 2008. Um, and I went to Creighton. That was my first pick for college. First one in my family to go to college. Went for nursing school. And um, opioids derailed my nursing career. Um, that's when I started freshman year of college, 18. Yeah. That's when I started to get dependent. 
and um, I think by then, like I'd had Percocet and Vicodin, but that was like the heart, like the most outpatient. And then I see at the same time, my dad had multiple prescriptions for pain medicine from multiple doctors. I didn't have that, just one doctor. Um, and he would give me his Darvacet and Vicodin too. Like we'd share them, like looking back, it's not good at all. <laughs> um, so I failed a drug test for nursing school and they were gonna have a hearing because I told them the truth about, because you know, they wanted to know if I had a prescription for the Darvacet. Darvacet's no longer on the market. Um, and I didn't have a prescription. So I told them, yeah, my, I, yeah, I don't have a prescription. It was given to me. And that was enough to take me out of nursing school and um, make me change my major. So I ended up um, transferring to UNMC, uh, University of Nebraska Med Center, and went to nursing school there, almost finished with my bachelor's, and I failed another drug test for the same medication, Darvacet. They made me go like mandatory drug counseling and things like that. But um, by that point, if I didn't have my medicine, like I was sick, like I started to go into withdrawal. And so that's really like when things started to take off, like uh, I guess weed has always been around me. Like I still use it, um, still have a broken spine. I try not to use it very much. I just deal with the chronic pain now. It's no fun. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's this. Um, and they put me on Valium when I was 15 too. And so not only did I have to get off opioids, I had to get off uh, benzodiazepines too. All while all this is being mixed. And um, I didn't realize seriously um, and how much danger I was in until the past couple of years. I could have, I'm very fortunate to be alive. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? What kind of stuff were you doing that risked your life? Oh my gosh, I could have, I could have overdosed mixing alcohol with prescription medications. Um, the so more about the pain medicine. So by 21, um, I was in nursing school. I had my first spine surgery. So this was 2011. And it, they all fail. So I was putting all of my hopes into, oh, everything would be okay with a, you know, with a magical surgical fix. How naive, how silly of me to think that. I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. Um, I started taking more than I was supposed to, like, like a pill extra here or there. Um, the doctor I had, I had so many doctors and just got passed around and they were just throwing pain meds at me left and right. And there was like no qu quantity limit on how, like what they were giving me. Like it was a lot. And the same thing with the Valium. So just mixing benzos and opiates, that's a deadly combination. Um, I used to get um, like dilated and morphine. So once I started getting a tolerance, you know, to like Vicodin and codeine, you know, not the lower pain medicines, but the not so potent, whatever you want to say. Understood. Um, by, yeah, by 21, I had had every opioid out there and I had a pain doctor who decided to put me on pure methadone, no Narcan, which they use only for severe, severe pain um, in non, like, that doesn't respond to other opioids. And I was hooked. 
I did not realize how dangerous methadone and Valium are together and Vicodin on top of it. Like I, uh, I got a DUI from driving on my pain medicine, crashed my car, 21, shortly after I started the methadone. Um, I was taking it as prescribed. I didn't realize how potent it was. And so, you know, I could have killed someone then. I could have killed myself driving like that. Like, I don't even remember driving. Um, I was so medicated that there's pictures of me slumped over, not conscious. It's really upsetting. Uh, people took videos of when I would, I call it nodding, like nodding. Yeah. And I didn't realize it was my medicine at the time. And the amount of medication they had me on, um, the doctor I had ended up getting in trouble with the FBI for the amount of prescriptions and it, it, it was not a fun life. Like I just lived from prescription to prescription. Like my whole life revolved around my pills. And then on top of it, um, I started when I was 17, I tried cocaine for the first time. Loved it, still love it. Haven't done it in a long time. Uh, so that's dangerous. Um, eventually I started, um, started doing, um, I never, only drug I haven't done is like heroin, fentanyl. I haven't, I never went out of my way to find that stuff. So when I was like mm, 22, 23, that's when I started. No, 21. Yeah. I was 21, I started um, experimenting with meth, acid, taking my pills with alcohol. Like I could drink a fifth, like a handle, like a fifth and still be so sober. And I'm only five foot four and 130 pounds. That's a lot. Yeah. That's, a, that's a lot, a lot. So just mixing all those medications and all those drugs being so little and putting myself around not safe people, around drug dealers, gangs. Um, I uh, stripped, escorted. It really led into a full crisis. Were you, were you living on your own <clears throat> that you had to go strip? I moved out at 17. Okay. And I was. Um, I lived, so I moved out after high school, I moved into the dorms and after I was there first semester and then was removed from the program and moved back in with my maternal grandparents. Um, and then my mom, dad, and two younger brothers, they still lived at our family house, but um, his drinking and drug use had gotten really bad, my father's, and he ended up losing our um, house, our family house when I was 21. And so they were homeless um, and my mom and brother being special needs. Um, it's always been the understanding that I'm gonna be their caregivers. So that's always been a weight on my shoulders, which is fine. Uh, so I didn't, know what way to go make faster money to try and help my dad and my family out other than uh, to go do that and that was the worst thing I could have done unfortunately it's not the first time I've heard this story one of the things I kind of always ask is was it scary for you doing that <clears throat> it it must have been really nerve-wracking I because me personally I cannot imagine doing that because I think I'd be too embarrassed. That's the main reason. I think what played in was I already had this predisposition, this like, you know, thinking I was only good 
for sex and thinking the only way to get love and attention was that, I guess, I don't, obviously that's not true. Um, yeah, it was scary. It was really dangerous. It ended up getting, I ended up getting trafficked, uh, human trafficked out of it. And the FBI helped me get out of that. How did that happen? <laughs> oh man. So, um, and you know, one of some of the videos are still out there from 10 years ago. Um, this was 2015 and this guy, he said he was a porn producer and I had it that mindset. Okay, well, I can do the porn business, I guess. I just don't want to be behind camera. Like it absolutely ate my soul away to do that for money, but I guess I thought I could live um, so this guy told me he was a producer looking for a, uh, administrative assistant and I should have known better. There was no paperwork. He didn't have me sign anything. I didn't do my due diligence. Like looking back at it now, there's so many red flags. Uh, but at the time I didn't know. Um, and so it started out as like, helping him find talent. And we went across state lines. He drove a meat freezer van. I should uh -huh. have known something was with, like, like, like it's a creepy van. It was really creepy looking back on it. Um, he's in prison now, but um, he, he didn't have all the proper paperwork. And it was, I guess I thought maybe it was amateur. Um, but then he started asking me to sleep with him and saying, I love you and all this weird shit. I was like, no, no, I'm good. And then he, he was just so unrelentless about it. I guess I stopped fighting because people take advantage of people um, who are in economic despair. That definitely happened. Um, man, this guy took advantage of me. Uh, you know, he, he had me um, audition these men. Uh, one time there was seven right in a row at some smoke shop. Like it, like so unprofessional, like no one in the business legitimately would do that. I didn't know that at the time. So I, uh, he takes me and three other girls to get uh, STD tested at Planned Parenthood and I was crying and it was like he was getting tested too like it was so weird uh and the nurse has me in the room I don't know like I was shaking like I was uncomfortable it, it was so uncomfortable uh and I just told her what was really going on and told her yeah this is supposed to be a porn production company well it turns out there was never any company there's nothing like that. So the FBI showed up um, at the Women's Center for Advancement and told them what was going on. Didn't know how to get away from this guy, Corey was his name. Um, gave them the information, they looked into it and uh, they, they sent him away. He didn't wanna go. Like he was like adamant on taking me back like not leaving me there. So that should have been like my first clue. Uh, but that's how, that's how they got me out. Um, and then they did some investigating and, and sent them to prison. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. I'm really, really fortunate. Once you got out of uh, that situation, how was your drug use? What was it like? Is it still going on heavy? Absolutely if not more, um, I decided to like private dance and all the girls that I met were using meth and Coke. So I started getting a Coke pretty heavy, uh, I was 23. And then I moved to intravenous cocaine use, tried shooting up a few times, that didn't work out. Haven't done it since, never will 
can't believe I did that. Um, but yeah, I was going down a really bad route fast. And uh, I, I can thank my grandparents for getting me some help. And also I was getting into legal trouble like the DUI and um, a friend was shoplifting and I was guilty by association. Um, I got drugged at a park and uh, passed out and woke up laying in the street. I was 25 and uh, I haven't been in trouble since then. And this chick roofied me at a club, she told me her boyfriend was beating on her. So I gave her a ride and you now she stole my Valium and my weed. And uh, the cops found me. And so, so it was not going in a good direction. Not at all. I fully expected to die. Didn't care if I died, didn't care what happened to me. I really didn't, which is really sad. Really, really sad. Uh, now, my, young, my youngest brother has um, a really bad drug addiction now. So if I can be the one addict in my family that gets out, I'd be happy. So when was the first time you realized you had a problem? <clears throat> when I got my DUI, that uh, a drive under the influence of drugs. I had no alcohol in my system. It was all pain pills and weed. I don't even remember being in the jail. Like I was so snowed. Um, when I got in trouble for failing a drug test at nursing school, that kind of. But then when I got my DUI two years later, um, obviously I kind of knew I had a problem. Kind of. Um, although didn't think I needed treatment or anything and no one was gonna get me off the pain medicine. I don't care what they said. Uh, that was my view then. So me like completely giving up my life for pain control and those medications, that, that was the first big flag, you know, of having a problem. What did you do about it once you realized? <clears throat> oh man, I was on probation several times. I kept failing the drug tests. I'm really surprised I didn't go to jail. I don't know why my probation officer didn't flag me, but that's okay. Um, went to AA, NA. Uh, therapy, uh, and now see a psychiatrist, uh, an addiction, specifically, it was an addiction psychiatrist and an addiction therapist that got me to the success where I am today. So I tried multiple times to, multiple, oh my God, so many times to stop the pain medicine. That never worked. Um, I kind of, I kind of just flew under the radar, to be honest with you. Like I wasn't really getting, and it's like people kind of ignored, kind of ignored it. I, I don't know. Um, everyone just told me to get help, and so I tried. Like I said, I tried AA and NA, and uh, my little brother was in trouble at that time, and so we were doing AA and NA together, and um, church. I guess I didn't really try that hard, to be honest. I was in a lot of denial. Now that I'm really sitting here and thinking about it, that was the most I kind of, it's like I had doctors tell me you have a big problem, but no one ever really told me about it um, until I decided finally in February of last year that I just could not, I couldn't live, it was either I die or something because um, that was no life to live and um, 
decided I found the addiction psychiatrist and addiction therapist and doctor and they got me off the methadone I de detoxed for two weeks that was horrendous and detoxing from benzos that was horrendous um I did that several times with the benzodiazepines that took longer to kick um so I've been sober of opiates since February 2nd of 2021 um, and I see the therapist once a week, like even though I'm uh, in sustained remission and on Suboxone, which saved my life. I lost 100 pounds. Who would have known that the methadone was making me weigh 100, 220 pounds? It's not my normal weight. Like I did not look like myself. Like I would, now I look like me. I looked so bad before and sick. It's kind of upsetting. So that's what I did. Cut people out that were not good for me, things like that. Right. So once <clears throat> once you found this psychologist or psychiatrist, have you relapsed since then? <clears throat> I have not relapsed at all off the opiates. I am so, so proud of myself. Like I didn't think I would be sitting here being able to say that. Uh, I made it a point to get rid of uh, people in my life that used, um, I was best friends with my, uh, my brother that's six years younger than me. Um, he wasn't so fortunate with the drugs. He's still struggling, um, and that's sad to see. Um, I've been sober from benzos. Um, I tried killing myself in March because of domestic violence. That's something also that's been big in my life is domestic violence, and I find that drug and alcohol abuse go hand in hand. With that, I've been through um, domestic violence shelters and things like that. So two years ago, left an ex-fiance that was abusing me and the Salvation Army helped me get in a sober living house, like a sober living apartment and um, things like that. I didn't have a choice but to change. And also the doctor that was prescribing me the medications like the morphine and all that, she was going to prison and no one else would prescribe me any of those medications. So I also didn't really have a choice but to either go to heroin or street pills, you know, or just pull the trigger and move on with my life if I can. I still use marijuana. I don't drink. It doesn't agree with me. I'll have like a drink here and there but I haven't gotten drunk in years. Once I started the pain medicine, like heavy, it just made me throw up. No one likes to throw up. We no. doesn't make me throw up. So I chose. So I, in my opinion, I'm, I'm sober. I don't know, I use marijuana as like an actual medicine. I used to use it way more, but now it's just here and there. So, so those were the things I did and um, never had a sponsor, never worked the steps. A lot of this was on sheer willpower, like, and having no, it's like either that or die. That was really what it came down to, or, you know, just keep living this horrible life. And luckily there was people that cared about me um, when I didn't care about myself. And um, these doctors have helped me see that I'm worth it. And uh, suicide's not the answer, never is. So that's, uh, that's my story. <laughs> so thank you for sharing my, I had two last questions. <clears throat> How do you stay how do you stay sober nowadays? <clears throat> I don't have a lot okay. I get drug tested by choice 
randomly. So that helps keep me accountable. I weaned myself off the Suboxone. It made me so sick. Oh my God, I lost a hundred pounds. Um, my favorite show is Intervention. I really, really, really wanted to be a nurse in a um, drug rehab facility. That was my whole thing when I was in nursing school, you know, to help others. Um, so helping others helps me. Um, I go to this program called Community Alliance and um, it's like a daytime mental health respite program. And they help you, it's like people who have had addictions and mental illness and things like that. Cause I've struggled with uh, major depression disorder and PTSD and you know, other things. Um, so we go there and they just give us extra support. Like they give you like housing support and counseling and extra therapists. And so I go Monday through Friday it's kind of like an outpatient program, but for mental health too. A lot of it is keeping myself accountable. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't go to AA or NA. I don't know how I'm doing this. Like I probably uh -huh. should. I don't know how other than I do not want to die. Like I had overdosed accidentally several times. And like looking at those pictures of me where I'm slumped over or watching intervention and like seeing, you know, just seeing everything. Um, you get tired of living it too. And then also I wanna be like an inspiration to my brother. I don't want him to, his big thing is meth. So I, I hope like, I, I blame myself for him doing drugs cause he started smoking with me. So, and they say only one in three addicts make it. So I spend a lot of time with family. Yeah. I don't know how I'm doing it. I'm doing it. That's all I know. <laughs> That's all easy. that matters is that you're doing it. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Like uh, having social support helps greatly. It helps really greatly. Maybe I should go back to AA. It's not bad. I just never had a sponsor work the steps and there's not very many people out there that are sober that haven't. So my last question to you is, do you have any advice for people watching and listening? No one is promised tomorrow, <laughs> no matter sober or not. And there is always help. We're not alone. I've, I suffered alone for no reason other than being afraid to trust and things like that. Um, you know, be an advocate for yourself, you know, educate yourself about drugs and alcohol and all the different things out there and um, oh my gosh there's I don't know if if you need help there's someone out there uh, whether it be like NAMI or AA or like uh, rehab like it's not a death sentence like it doesn't you don't have to live your life every day that way. I thought I was doomed to be on pain meds the rest of my life, miserable, sick. But that's not true. And just living one minute at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time, you know, whatever it takes for, uh, for you to get through the day and not to, uh, not to be so hard on yourself because uh, relapse is part of um, recovery and if you fall off the horse so be it just what's important is how you get yourself up and keep riding that's that's my advice um, and and no one 
is like not celebrities, not politicians, like no one is immune to the disease of addiction. It can hit a homeless man or a billionaire, you know, it could hit a housewife, garbage man, it don't matter. It affects everyone, but um, it's not to give up hope. That's, that's my message. And that's a great message. Thank you. Did you I'm have 31 anything? and there's so much more life to live. I can only, if I've lived this much life in 16 years, I can only imagine what the next 50 years holds. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good place to wrap up. I really appreciate you doing this today. Yeah. Thank you, Jim, so much. All right. So hang tight. And for everybody watching and listening, if you like what you heard and saw, go below and give us a like. Also subscribe to see when we upload new videos. You can check us out on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. So also check out our website, www.addicts-anonymous.com. There you'll find a lot of approved literature as well as resources available for everybody. So that's all I have for today and until next time.